you reviewing or? This meeting is being recorded. Colin, it's funny you bring that up because that's exactly what I asked uh, Nancy to do in this, have the, them do in this meeting that oh, okay. um, it's been uh, since August, well, July of 2021, when this whole process started, when we picked the uh, firm and we've been through lots of chapters and I took Brenda's emails as a, as a good hunch that yes, we needed to review exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, should we be reviewing each chapter along with what's presented, et cetera, et cetera. So as Chris, you said, we've got a, a limited amount of time. So I'm just gonna shut up and let you get on with it. Thanks. Yeah, I'm good with discussing it in planning and zoning. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Does everyone have the presentation? Got it. Okay. Yep, yeah, we can see it. Uh, let me do slideshow. Okay. Um, so just before we get started, I, I kind of it had skipped my mind that um, we had two new members. So the presentation is more of an overview, but kind of getting to those last two comments. This is a chance for us to kind of step back and regroup, assess where we're at, and and make sure um, we all know what to be doing going forward. So that's a, a re so some really good comments. Um, just a, a precursor to the whole presentation is um, the drafts you all received, um, Planning Commission Steering Committee received um, through the later months of last year are still the latest drafts. Um, we have been filtering things up to council. Um, that have comments or notes from both your input and their input, but we're kind of waiting to amend all those once we get the full picture and, and essentially can start building that into um, the, the final recommended draft. So um, for those of you trying to catch up or new members, you're, you're, you, have all the, you have access to the same information that everyone else has. I know it's kind of more of a fire hose of information. So hopefully this presentation gives you a little bit of a taste um of where we're going and then um one of the slides i put in an earlier council presentation that's not in this that now i'm kind of wishing it was was we're presenting all of this information in, in three kind of levels of detail one an executive summary that's just kind of a high level of what each of the chapters is addressing compared to what your current codes are addressing um two is what we call section maps where we'll go through section by section of the proposed code and identify um, where similar topics are addressed in your current code and then put a brief comment about how we're addressing it differently um, or if it's a new section and why it's a new section um, or if nothing's changing, why, why nothing's changing. So that gives you kind of a, a, an easier way to kind of wade into the code as much as you want. And then obviously all the draft sections for those people that want to really get into the, the nuts and bolts and details of it um, will be available. So those all of those things that we delivered um, late last year are the current status. And you can kind of check either the ones that went to you or the council, I believe, um, are available on the website. Or if not, we or staff can get them to you guys. Um, but then um, this presentation is kind of about where some of those things may be shifting um, and what the next steps are. So um, it's not necessarily a complete introduction for those of you new members, but it is sort of a, let's take a step back and, and regroup and remind ourselves of the overall approach to the code. So um, with that, I'll start jumping into um, where we've been. So the left side is how we began to reorganize your current Title 16. So all of the same substance of your current code the the development standards are are there but we just tried to organize it in a um, more logical structure based on those chapters um, the right side are all the all the meetings we've kind of been through and how we addressed different topics the main one being um, when we started out in this process uh, we were grouping things under key goals of the comprehensive plan or your code assessment that was done in 2020 and 2021. How are we addressing those really key issues? And so that technical committee of staff and um, a, a few additional stakeholders sort of guided some of those discussions that led to the drafts that then steering committee and council addressed as, as just shown there. Um, and as you can see, there's a few lingering um, work sessions at council that are coming up. Um, that will play into this and I'll, I'll kind of close with that when, when we get to our next steps. 
Um, so that's kind of where we've been. And, and the other part of this is um, that's not mentioned here is the, the public engagement that we did. And um, well, about this time last year, February through um, June, we were, um, before we even started putting pen to paper of drafting changes, we started a, a big public engagement session on some of these key topics that you'll see in this, um, reflected in this as well. So we still have all of that information captured and saved. So for particularly for the new members, um, if you need access to any of it, we're more than happy to, to help assist you and, and help you get up to speed. Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have yep. some neighbors who are texting me um, saying they can't get in. Nancy, can you help fix that? Uh, I don't see anyone in my in my queue yeah, for attendees. I, what I'm getting is no one can get in. I mean, I can try to send them a meeting ID, but something must be wrong. Are, are they trying to join the UDC steering committee meeting or the planning and zoning commission meeting? Because if they're trying the seven o'clock link, they won't be able to get in. Okay, I will planning commission. I will respond via text. Okay. And uh, I got the same happening. I got the same message from somebody and I sent the same thing. I said it's not the PNZ meeting, it's the UDC. So hopefully that'll Correct. help. Okay, so we'll give it a few minutes and see what happens. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I will keep progressing, but let me know if we need to stop and wait for anyone. Um, to join. Um, if that's no, necessary. the committee is all here. This it sounds like it would be the public, Chris. Okay. So thank you. Yep. Um, so this slide kind of captures our, our overall approach. Um, you know, development codes address can can address three main things, and um, the planning profession in general is shifting from. Um, a, a historic focus on the left side of the screen, looking just at land uses to moving more towards the right side of the screen of looking at um, how large scale pieces fit together and then uh, an increasing emphasis on design. Um, your current code exhibits that trend as it was amended over time. You have a lot of design standards, you have a lot of form standards um, and you have a lot of use standards, but essentially um, this effort and following on the some of the policies of the comprehensive plan, um, which was developed in, in 2016, and, and some of your other planning initiatives that have followed up on that plan, is recognizing that particularly a city in Inglewood's context, a, a, a urban near downtown, fully built out, um, highly connected community, um, shifting from use to design is, is um, an important strategy. Um, and that's not to say that we ignore land uses at all. It's more of just um, when we, we can simplify our standards actually by shifting more towards the right of the screen. And again, most, most of the things that we're doing, um, talking about when we're regulating design are, are already in your code in some form or another. Um, since communities don't very often revise wholesale, do complete updates to their development code, this is our opportunity to do it more in a, a more systematic way. Um, so with that, the, the other element of the code is Im improving um, both the user friendliness and, and improving it as a decision making tool. And so that's we, we call it flexibility and certainty when you know, we're always here two things when we do um, code updates from particularly from developers or those who are regulated. If you know if they would just tell me what the standards are, um, I'd be happy to comply. Um, and the second thing is, well, if they would just give me flexibility to do what I want, I would be happy as well. And, and those appear completely inconsistent, but this slide kind of talks about how we regulate it. As we're, as we're shifting more towards design, um, it becomes more and more problematic of being right. Um, in other words, the standard is X. So the above conventional approach um, just is basically what historically the planning profession has done is you know we develop our standards, we apply it, and if it's wrong, we tell someone to go get a variance. Um, we want to shift more towards a, a system of how we build and why, and less to a, a collection of regulations. So as we do that, your, your draft code, you know, the standards are critically important, and we want to write them in the most objective, simple way as possible. But we're also big on some of the non-regulatory non language in the code. So on the front end, um, intent statements and what we're trying, what we're trying, what outcomes we want that guide how we apply those standards. And then on the back end, decision-making criteria and, and when do, should we consider alternatives? And then the variance as a last resort. So that's a way of balancing um, 
the the twin goals of having flexibility but also increasing certainty so that's is scattered throughout this code now as well that we're kind of taking a step back and looking at the larger perspective um, so this is what it looks like in um, in a specific application so that that lower bar that we said you you know we have the objective measurable standard but usually in front of all of those we'll have an intent statement or design objectives that say you know why are we doing this what are we hoping to achieve and that helps us interpret that standard we may have context based criteria things that refine where and how we apply it and when and then we we are able to evaluate that objective measurable standard um, when we're running into problems of, well, that's not really achieving the, it's not really appropriate for that context or it's not achieving the outcome we want, um, we'll have some design strategies that give you options. You know, there's there may be one, two or three or more ways to achieve that standard. And then lastly, before we get to a variance, we can build in some exceptions and administrative adjustments. The key thing here is giving staff the ability to consider things that are equally um, achieving those goals or better achieving those goals within parameters. That's that's the, the approach we're trying to take. So in chapter two, that we built in a specific procedure of administrative adjustments. Again, you, you have that in your code right now, but it's not really done in a systematic way. And so that section is kind of crucial that building in that flexibility at the staff level. And, and obviously staff can't make any decision they want. So they have parameters and criteria um, of when things are, are out of their hands, some of the flexibility that we're talking about. Chris, can I stop you for just a second? Yes. Um, Suzanne, have you heard from anyone? Are they able to get in or have they still had some trouble? They're still okay. having some trouble. I'm getting, the passcode is too short. It looks to me like the meeting invite that was sent to us doesn't match the meeting invite or at least the passcode that's on the city's website. Um, I just, re please let them know, I just republished the link okay. that, I, that I've sent to like Noel and Kate because they were, weren't able to get in either. So I, so could you please just ask them to, uh, try again and I did hear from I got an email from someone and I sent them the link as well so I'm not sure what okay. happened but I've republished it and I'll check the one for planning commission as well as Chris continues all right Kate. thanks for bearing with the interruptions because that's this okay. is a public meeting and it's kind of important uh, absolutely Kate you had your question your hand up did you have a question I was just going to mention that that it said it was expired I did try the planning commission link as well just to see if that worked and it also said as it was expired Okay, I will do that. Carl? Yeah, have they tried coming in on the uh, the agenda? The agenda has a phone number, and I think there's a, a link in the agenda on the public uh, comments part of it. I believe okay. there is. I'll republish both. This I republished this meeting and I'll republish the link for planning commission. So we do have a member of the public uh, who's who's here, so they've been able to join. So hmm. Michelle, yeah, I just tried to log in again and it worked this time. So thank okay, you. great, you bet. I'll make I'll just double check the planning commission as well. Okay, Chris. Okay, um, I will keep proceeding. And and so for those of you just joining, it. Um, Rather than go back, this is being recorded. So if you need to catch up, um, it will be recorded and you can go back to the beginning, but um, we're, we're sort of just getting started into the substance as well. So you may not have missed too much. Um, so this, this is our approach to flexibility in general. So that administrative adjustments is a way to, particularly when we're increasing um, the emphasis on design and where the standards um, maybe one possible way of doing things but there could be others we don't want to over regulate in the design area as well so it's an area where where flexibility is important as long as we're meeting the intent and and the objectives that um of the standards to begin with and and I, and then we will there's tiers of um, how much flexibility does staff have to make decisions how much flexibility does the planning commission have and, and then ultimately things that go up to the to the city council and that's a way of not shifting so many things to oh well just go get a variance from the board of adjustments because that's that's usually intended for things that are truly exceptional and hardships and unique and um, a lot of these things in the design realm aren't necessarily that it's just how do we how do we 
implement the plans and goals and policies of the city through some of these different opportunities and, and objectives. Um, so with that, the, the main, any of the areas where we are increasing the emphasis of design are the things where that administrative adjustment process will come in, that opportunity for flexibility. And so those are summarized here in, in chapters, I won't go through all of them, um, but mainly it's chapters three, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, chapter three deals with big picture kind of public realm design, so streets and open spaces. Chapter five is dealing with residential design. Chapter six is dealing with non-residential design. Chapter seven is access and parking. And, and chapter eight is landscape, that part of site design. So um, I'll go through some of those um, higher level details of each of those chapters too, as we move forward. So that's sort of the operating system. Um, when we get to each of those elements, I'll go through now. So design standards with streets. Uh, we're dealing with two main challenges here on streets. One is the idea that, um, you're a built out community, you're not building new streets through regulation. So we're almost always talking about retrofitting existing right of way. And that can be a challenge. Um, and two, because of that, you're often dealing with incremental um, opportunities to improve that. So site or at least block scale opportunities to improve street design is, is um, what we're looking for. And, and that's the more difficult challenge. Um, the top represents what your current standards say with regard to streets right now. And um, it's mainly just uh, right away road width and, and a sidewalk width. And it doesn't show how those components go together. In the code, we're trying to implement a lot of different urban design standards that are essential to how you use that public space. Um, and again, this is public right away. So it's not really regulating development. It's regulating your, your public realm. Um, so we would hope to see this used as a guide to, um, as you kind of, as developments occurring, maybe causing someone to retrofit a, a, a streetscape or as capital improvements are done, perhaps this could become a, a guide for how we would think about assembling that. Um, the, the, the first challenge I mentioned that you're dealing with existing right away, we're having, we're setting up default standards for how these different street types come together, um, but each block in your community each street is probably unique so we, while we're setting up default standards for these street types this what's reflected on the left of the screen are some rules for how you would might apply those when you don't quite have enough room or space so how do you um, deal with some of those competing priorities whereas the code currently has nothing with regard to that we think this is at least improving that so that you can begin to make better decisions on some of those trade-offs now the second challenge i mentioned was how do we do this on a site or block basis is a little more difficult to deal with, but we're hoping that um, having this guy can let you spot opportunities where it doesn't need to be a full-fledged capital improvement and maybe we can do some experimental things on a block by block basis um, that let us assemble streets um, in, in a different way to create social spaces, to create multimodal things, all the things that are in your, your plans and policies. Um, I know one of the things this committee discussed in great detail when we were looking at some of the street section was the idea of, um, particularly with bike transportation, um, there was some discussion and debate on, well, the bike lanes really ought to be um, protected or they ought to be on the other side of parking. And so this chart here talks about all those different decisions. It's not really easy to write a specific standard to that, but what we wanna do is be flagging the best practices so that when it comes time to assemble a street and actually make changes, you have all the right resources to, to decide what's the best use of that space because there are competing priorities. Um, and one of the reasons we put such an emphasis on streets, even in a community like yours where we're not regulating them into existence, they, they're there, is we're big believers in those set the context for what we can ask private development to do. Um, so not every street's the same. So when you think of like, a, a large scale traffic moving arterial, um, it doesn't make sense to require buildings to front on it and be designed in a very pedestrian way. Um, whereas on other streets that are slow, have um, on-street parking and those types of things, it completely makes sense to regulate that. So that'll come up later when we get to the non-residential design standards. Uh, a second area we're dealing with is uh, another area I should say is the des um, in design standards is open space. Uh, the code currently has 
basically thinks of space as just a percentage of development. And we want to begin thinking of it more in types of spaces. Um, since you're mainly in a built out urban context, we're leaning more towards the the, the left-hand row of those, like those smaller, more formal spaces, but, but not exclusively. Um, and so how do we translate that from larger scale development or neighborhood serving open space versus site and lot open spaces? Chris, we have a question from Brenda and then yeah, um, right. I wanted to give a chance to go back to public comment now that we've yeah. got folks logging back in. So let's get Brenda's question first. Thank you. I, I think one of the things that um, has been very confusing for our group is um, identifying some um, of these design suggestions. And this question is for Brian. Does do these design uh, open space standards affect the downtown development uh, that's pending? Does it directly affect all of that? Like this, would this code, would this apply to that? I just, or is the downtown development a completely separate with its own zoning and will be, and the city will decide what kind of open space or whatever requirements that will have outside of this is my question for Brian. Do you kind of understand um, what I'm saying? Yeah, and the last process that it went through, I know there was a zoning change request associated with it. It might be best, um, Um, any basically any of the the items that we put in this code affect the city, you know, the, any kind of development inside the city. So if they're trying to do if I, I and right now I don't know where that project stands. Um, so if there's coming back with any kind of different proposal that would require a plan unit development, they could come in and alter some of our standards, like you've seen with some of the more recent PUDs that have come through. Um, but that may be a question I might want to talk to John and Dan about. And that would be helpful. An yeah. yeah, that would be helpful. About, Maybe we follow up on that. I mean, I was there for the whole, I, a number of us, I think, watched the workshop that they had Saturday or so ago. And um, I'm not worried, <laughs> you know, that they're going to find something that's just completely off the mark of what this is happening but I wondered how much they're counting on this. Are they counting on us to do this first and then the downtown project because they'll have this in stone or are we just breaking two different things apart? So yeah, if you could maybe follow up on that, I would be grateful. Yeah. Yeah, and I would just add to, to round that out. Um, we would, at this scale, these types of open spaces, we're thinking very much like we are with streets. Um, because you're a built out community, we're, we're often not regulating these into existence. But the helpful thing about putting these in the code is how does development respond to these spaces? So you respond differently to a trail adjacency or a, um, some type of park or neighborhood adjacency than you would to a more formal space like a courtyard or a plaza. Um, so we're keying the standards off of if those exist. So if they come into existence through a, a planning effort or a capital investment of the city, they may not come in exactly like the code is saying, but what that's giving us is cues for how development should respond to it. So um, we are kind of tracking that and we can get you a more complete answer once we get um, input from John and the rest of the crew. So Brian, did I understand you want to go back to public comment since, and I do apologize to our public that you were having difficulty with the link. What is your preference, Brian? Sorry, I was clicking the wrong button. Uh, yes, to go back to public comment. Okay, so for our public, if you would like to uh, address the committee, you'll have three minutes. If you could just raise your hand and then I will call on you as I see you on, on my screen. If you're here to just listen, that is perfectly fine as well. But if you wanted to make any comments, uh, just please raise your hand virtually and I, I will um, allow you to talk. I'm not seeing any hands, so uh, perhaps our public is just here to, oh, I do see a hand whose hand is that. Ah, Jeanette, 
Okay, give me a sec. It's going to give you a prompt to allow you to talk. You're going to have to accept that. And then um, And I'm unmuted, so can you hear me now? We can. Good. Since you're talking about open space in developments, I'm, I was, I'm looking at, for instance, a new development that's coming in just south of me, which is actually Littleton. And apparently Littleton considers parking space to be open space. Um, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm feeling reassured that what you're discussing here is green space and not parking space. Am I understanding that right? Uh, yes, I'll go. Yeah, you are. Um, I think there's two different standards that we would look at. One that would can sometimes open space is a proxy for limiting the building mass and scale, in which case parking um, would count to that because it's non building space. But we're talking about actually either landscape area or usable active open space in, in this requirement. So we're trying to flip the emphasis to from just purely building coverage to something that's more um, serving a function. Okay, did anybody else want to address the committee? Jeanette, I see your hand is still up. Did I'm going to unmute you real quick. I'm sorry, I hadn't seen that you can actually put your hand down. <laughs> okay, so you've never good. seen that before, sir. I know, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeanette. I appreciate you participating. I don't see any other hands. So at this point, are we, I believe, Brian, we may be good to let Chris, Chris okay, we've got somebody right now. Hold on, sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, Jennifer. Yes, good evening, can you hear me? You can, if you give me a second, I need to start the clock. Go ahead. I, I think my question is, it's just more of a question. The link was wrong that was shared. So I think there's a lot of us on here that just don't have any idea what's been discussed yet because we've just entered the meeting. So I'd love to have some comment, but I, I I have absolutely no idea what's been said so far. So I don't know if it makes sense because the link was wrong and we've all been struggling to get in if we start over or just rehash what's been talked about just so that we can get caught up. Maybe I can jump in on that, Jennifer. And, and thank you for joining in when, when you did. Uh, these are all recorded um, so that you have access to it. Typically the public comment would be the very first thing that we would do. So we wouldn't normally have things to comment on as we're going through uh, the process. And, you know, as much as I think we would all love to get everyone up to speed, we only have about a half hour left to discuss these items. I believe there are future meetings or future opportunities for you to be able to continue doing that. And we do apologize for the lack of ability to at the very beginning of this meeting, but I think unfortunately we're gonna have to move forward unless there's other objections that um, some of the other council members uh, feel. Okay. For commission members. Thank you. Thank you. No, let's proceed. Okay. I think. Thanks. That was very good. And and thank you, Jennifer. But yeah, it wasn't much. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and just to to build on that for those of the public just joining. Um, this presentation is geared towards the steering committee and kind of doing a recap of what they've covered over the last month. So I would expect many of you are sitting there kind of, what does any of this mean? So um, just like uh, the chair of the committee mentioned, there are opportunities built in later for more public engagement, more comment for you to fully understand all of these topics. So um, don't. I hope you don't get frustrated if we're hitting things that are very high level or things that people have discussed previously in previous meetings, um, we'll get as much information as you need to fully understand this um, before we even propose something for formal adoption. Chris, we have a question from Kate. Thanks. Um, I have a question actually, because I wasn't sure if we were going through the, <laughs> through the presentation first, um, but I had one about the streetscapes and then also about the open space. Um, with the streetscape, 
component. I was just wondering, and I, I think some of this has even evolved since we started this process, but with the increase in use of e-bikes um, and micro mobility, um, does it seem as though the e-bikes or the, excuse me, the bicycle lane standards that are in there, um, would those accommodate future e-bikes or how might we consider that in the future? Um, and I bring it up because e-bikes can go 35 miles an hour. <laughs> and so they're a great way to get around communities. Um, but it may be that uh, a typical bike lane isn't going to accommodate that and something forward thinking we may want to consider for the future, um, as well as other forms of micro mobility like the electric scooters and, and things like that. So just um, considerations for that. And then also with the sidewalks in considering, um, I think this came up recently in uh, development, but considering width of sidewalks near or adjacent to um, transit, especially light rail stations, and making sure that that can accommodate um, a, a larger amount of pedestrian activity. Yes, so and, you, oh, go ahead. That's all I had for streets. <laughs> okay. And then um, I had a question about or comment about park. Yeah, no, that that hits directly at the kind of the, the first challenge I mentioned that um, we don't necessarily have an, an exact right standard for every street or segment, but what we have is a decision making tools. Um, so the challenge you mentioned on the e bikes and um, and what's the right location. The two things we do know is um, the best street design there's there's always with street design there's always two challenges is it for transportation or is it for public space and the answer is it's both some streets might be more about mobility some streets might be more about being in a place and so we want a decision making process that lets you do that so it's entirely possible that we actually you know we're often saying we want cars to slow down as they enter a place it's also true with the advent of e-bikes that we want the bikes to slow down as well. Um, so the, the decision-making tool that we're trying to, to put in there is um, where are we trying to slow things down versus where are we just trying to get things through? Um, and speed differential is, is the key to, to all of these things. And so um, the bicycle lane standards have that kind of uh, decision-making process. And I know, um, these numbers might even be reflecting one of the earlier drafts where I think this committee raised some question on, you know, some of these numbers of, of where it's comfortable and where it's not are, are too are off. Um, the issue of, well, now we've got bikes that go um, five to 10 miles an hour for an average bicyclist to ones that go 20 miles per hour for an e-bike. Um, that's kind of, that's new territory for us in, in um, balancing this, but what we, where we would default to is the ones going faster really kind of should be blending in with traffic more than they should be in a, in a facility where pedestrians or bikers might be. Um, the other part of not having the exact right standards that we know we do have resolved is we have a lot of default resources to NACTO, um, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. That's the group of both planners and engineers that are on the leading edge of all of this. And they're doing it in a very urban design oriented um, way that, in other words, streets serve development of urban places. Streets aren't about engineering for traffic. So shifting your guidance to those documents rather than um, a, a traffic engineering document can help us figure out what the right solution is for any one street. Great, thank you. And yeah, I like the um, pointing to NACTO and then also just considering that, yeah, it's new territory and things that may have to be adjusted and thought about as, as we move forward or in the future. Um, I guess my next comment is related to both this and the parks and any considerations of moving beyond ADA access, ADA access I guess, into more universal access. Um, and if there's like considerations for that within our design standards or to meet a minimum, especially with, or more than just the minimum, especially with um, our having Craig and other facilities in, in England. Sorry about the. Yeah, on, on that one, I would say we don't, um, I think everything we're doing is trying to in, increase um, the emphasis more on people oriented spaces and and to some extent, recognizing that the people come with all different abilities and mobilities. Um, so I think we're, we're pushing in the right direction. Um, and 
I, although we may not have um, specific standards about universal design, I think that's one of those territories where that's always going to be something where if an alternative does that better, this code will, will accept that as something that the, the city should um, approve and implement. Brenda, you had your hand up, but put it down. Did you have something? Oh, well, th this, um, I'm, I'm hoping we can get through the kind of this recap tonight, but um, a very excellent point is that, and this is the, the point I tried to make in um, getting us together, was that we do need to discuss streets. And, and I think that that's a whole meeting on just that topic and this, so that we have a good understanding and we know, and we'll be visiting this again, I assume, when we um, get a draft, right? And we vote on that draft. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay, cool. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, and I think just to round that out, the key thing about streets is, um, this adopted regulation won't necessarily make anything happen because it only responds to development proposals and it doesn't force the city to do anything necessarily other than having the right um, complementary design approach to the proposals. So I would see those future conversations about streets very much being about, hey, for, for example, your downtown, let's do a downtown street network plan based on these concepts. And that street network plan will let you tweak all of these numbers that you see on this screen in that specific plan. Or let's do a particular capital improvements project for um, a major street in the city. And, and then in this case, this chart will let you tweak and adjust all those numbers based on those plans. Um, so things that are outside of regulating development, but they're the city kind of investing in its, in its own property. Um, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly through some of the other design topics, um, just in the interest of wrapping up in our, our hour we have. Um, so the, the third major topic is neighborhood design, neighborhood character. And so similar to what we just talked about on streets and open spaces, um, what we're trying to do is to set up the, the, the left side of the screen is not private property. It's what's our context? Um, what is our streetscape? What are our civic spaces? Um, what's the public realm that we want development to stand to respond to? Um, and then based on those criteria, we can shift to the left side of the screen, which is development. What building types, um, what, what's the scale and massing of those, and what are the frontages that relate these projects to the street? So um, similar, this is a similar graphic to that land use issue we, we showed earlier on as we shift more towards the design of these elements um, based on these standards on the right, more things can go together. So we're, we're trying to focus more on um, form, format, and scale and less on use. And we're trying to do so in a way that responds to the different contexts that you're designing around within your community. With uh, non-residential design, community character, we're, we're following a, a very a similar approach. Um, so the left side of the screen shows it's it, this is a great book and resource, by the way, that um, you know when we're talking about building communities for people, walkable urban places, there's really only three things we need to focus on, those three rules. Um, easier said than done because you know not every place in the city is is um, ideal for this in, a, in the when we're talking about the non-residential components. Um, however, if similar to what we're you know building flexibility and building expectations, um, we're setting up a system where we want to base different frontage design standards on the types of streets you're, you're building to. So going from A to D, so A being the most pedestrian oriented to D being the least pedestrian oriented. And you need all of those in your community to make it work. It's just how do we refine and filter that? So we're setting up default standards for how buildings and sites should relate to the frontage based on what type of street you're on. And from there, that will cue us in to okay, what should your building design standards be based on how, how close you're oriented to that street? Um, so that the idea of making the building permeable and human scale and, and, and um, having lots of features that are interesting to engage in, well, and what your closest buildings need to have a higher degree of that and your further away buildings don't need that as much. Um, and then the last part is rounding out the open spaces, um, part of which would be um, how do we hide and disguise parking? How do we create social spaces in these areas and, and having different standards for different contexts and what we're trying to achieve. So we're trying to, to simplify 
um, non-residential design, so commercial and mixed use areas based on these three principles. And then uh, lastly, rounding that out, the site and landscape standards, uh, you know, filling in the pieces, um, we've repurposed a lot of your current landscape standards. And I, I should back up a minute. All of the things that we've discussed with regard to design, you currently have standards addressing these topics. They're just not done in a, in a directly coordinated way or in a direct, directly context-based way. And so that's the system we're trying to put in. So when we get to that last piece of where should landscape go and how should it be oriented, we're trying to put an emphasis on the streetscapes and frontages. Um, so creating that um, engagement of development to the spaces that other people encounter most, and then dealing with where do we need to um, separate and create barriers with the parking areas and buffers and screens. Um, and all of that done in a more um, intentional and performance oriented way with the um, some flexibility with how, how are you achieving some of these goals. Um, a couple of points to the committee um, on things that have changed since um, we last presented to you in, in the later part of last year. One is on the bulk plane. Um, in the initial draft, the, the left side of your, your screen is the current standard, which we discussed. And we came up with a concept that we thought was a, maybe a more flexible standard where we gave just simply an, an, an allowance or an area of which you can be can be built closest to the side lot line. And based on that number, you could arrange it, your sort of allocation in any way you wanted. And so the idea was perhaps we would get more flexibility in the building massing because the developers are tending to wanna to max out their buildable area because of land costs. And that's an understandable market condition. Um, but if we gave them more options to go up, which is shown in this last um, picture, but in doing that, you couldn't go back as far was the concept. Um, so you, you wouldn't solely be, be pushing things towards this sort of tent approach to a building. And, and we may get more interesting options and opportunities for massing buildings in a different way while still meeting the interest um, of not having negative impacts on your adjacent property. So if we could set a budget for, you know, for in simple terms, use it all this way horizontally at a low scale, or use it all vertically at a, at a large scale or anything in between, and then you might get any of these options. Um, in discussing it with staff and, and also with some of the council presentations, um, there was some thought that that's not gonna work as well as we thought. There were some unintended consequences. So that shifted us to go back to, let's, do, let's take two strategies. Since the bulk plane was familiar and working fairly well and actually had some exception criteria in there, let's just simply expand the exceptions. So um, there's currently an exception that would allow something that's shown in this picture for a dormer um, that would be limited. And so what we tried to do was say, well, the, let's, let's build on that and allow more exceptions, but the bigger your exception, the larger your rear setback would be. So it's kind of trying to merge those two processes while keeping your current bulk plane. Um, the second thing we did take the opportunity to do is the bulk plane currently doesn't apply to any buildings that are over five plus units. So things that are currently allowed in the, particularly in the R, M, MUR three zoning districts, um, the, the five plus unit buildings don't have any standard. Um, in that case, we set a, a step back standard for upper stories would need to be set back a certain distance. So that's a new approach and um, the, the drafts are out there and we can certainly um, discuss it with the committee or, or wait till we reviewed the drafts and circle back to that. But we think this revised approach is, is a better approach. It does have implications to a topic we will shift to in a moment here on, on housing. Um, so the, the one that this is the area where the newest, most new um, things from where this committee last left off have been shifting. And this is the this project is paired with a, um, a grant to look at affordable housing for the city. And so we've been working in parallel with Root Policy on um, they're doing housing studies and, and um, doing feasibility studies on some of the residential building types that we've been talking about. And they're basically helping us tailor the standards and incentives to what would we consider if we get certain amounts of affordable housing in a project. 
Um, so those have become more developed since this committee last talked. Um, essentially, we're considering five, four main options. Um, the first is it not necessarily related to that affordability and attainability aspect, although it does prevent, present a new price point and housing option. This committee last left off with accessory dwelling units of recommending expanding that into all um, R1 districts. It's currently only allowed in R1C. Um, so expanding it into both R1A and B. And then the idea of entertaining, perhaps we'll have two accessory units on larger lots. Um, so the council direction was to expand that to even go down to 6,000 square foot lots, as well as removing some of the parking requirements for ADUs. And on each of these bullet points that I'm talking now that are current council discussion topics, um, I'll have a follow-up slide that we'll, we'll talk a little more specifically about it. Uh, the second change that they have considered is something that we were suggesting with um, the city currently has a manufactured housing um, district. It's, it's fairly limited and it, you have several of these types of projects in your community and it's very dated. And so what we were suggesting was let's broaden that um, housing tool, but also improve and increase the community design aspects of it by building in a lot of the things that we're talking about with, with neighborhoods in general and improving um, those community design aspects. So in doing that, the council was interested in, in increasing the applicability so it wouldn't just be allowed in industrial districts as is shown here in this table, but that it could possibly be allowed in, in the MUR3 zoning districts, those districts that are already um, regulated for multifamily, multi-unit development projects. Uh, it's 649. Okay, I'm getting close to wrapping up here, so I'll speed up a little bit. Um, the third element is um, in those districts that already allow multi-unit building types um, to keep the height limits where they are right now um, and, and sort of use that to our advantage. So if, for those of you that don't know, it's 32 feet in some districts, 40 feet in another district. So basically um, three to three and a half, maybe four story buildings is where you're at with those limits. But in exchange for having increased um, affordability in your project for those multi-unit projects, um, allowing either a height bonus, a parking reduction or a combination of both. And then the last one was expanding uh, opportunities for two to four unit houses in R1 districts. So the easy way to think of this, if the building is scaled and, and meets the standards of what is otherwise allowed in that district, why wouldn't we allow it to have two, three, or four units? And so that's being discussed as well. So those are the four main ones. I'll go through kind of the details of each of those. So with ADUs, the biggest thing to focus on here is one, that question of bringing, allowing lots as small as we last left off with this community that the lot would have to be 7,200 square feet. So your R1B lot, before it, it would have two units. Um, the council was directing us to go down as far as 6,000 square feet. So an R, R1C lot. Um, in doing so, we're recommending that when you do that, at least one of those units would have to be attached or internal to the house so that you're not necessarily adding another detached building, um, but that it's, it's a similar scale to what was otherwise uh, proposed. And, and saying that all of these are obviously the buildings and and site are gonna to have to meet all the lot coverage, bulk plane, building design standards as well. Um, two other larger ones from the council was removing the owner occupancy requirement. When we last off, left off with this committee, we were going to keep it. Um, so there's an idea out there to either remove it or to have it sunset after a period of years. Um, and then removing the parking requirement uh, was another one. We had it when we last left with this committee that um, the par one parking space per accessory unit would be required, wouldn't necessarily have to be in a garage, but it could just be a parking pad, particularly for the alley access houses. We didn't think that was too onerous. Um, however, the council wanted us to, to just remove the requirement altogether. Um, so those were the, the bigger changes with the ADUs. Um, another note, I think what was discussed here was the, the second bullet point from the bottom is revising this size limit. Um, so it's a little bit complicated having two different measures. And so we're looking at, based on the direction of both this committee and the council, having a single measure that's, um, that makes sense and is 
slightly more lenient than the current standards. Um, with regard to that small format housing that I mentioned, the things that people typically think of as a um, mobile home park in the old, old terms um, or a manufactured home park in, in more recent terms, um, what we're trying to do is evolve it into a broader range for a wide range of smaller format housing communities. And so there's lots of good examples for doing that. The biggest direction, and you currently have standards for this, they're set up in a fairly prohibitive way. In fact, we suspect most of the current instances of these projects don't meet your current standards. Um, but we're, what we're looking at is reducing the minimum project size. So this could currently happen on smaller projects than their, your eight acre requirement. Um, increasing the density um, because these are very small units that number often gets well above eight units per acre, which is your current standard. And then, as I mentioned earlier, allowing some of these projects to occur in the MUR3 rather than right now, it's only an allowed use in the I-1 district. And then lastly, rounding out the direction to consider the, the two to four unit buildings in the R1 and particularly in the R1A zoning district. Um, what we have before council is some um, points on potential outcomes that we need to be aware of. Um, in other words, it, it, because some of these lots in all of the R1 districts, but particularly the R1A, aren't um, built out to the maximum extent possible, um, we need to be prepared and make sure we have standards that um, regulate that in an appropriate way um, as we consider this opportunity. And, and this is only being done in exchange for ensuring that at least one of the units is affordable based on the housing policy and studies. Um, so what we plan on going back to the council and discussing in March is um, looking at a few different alternatives that would still result in meeting those goals, but may address some of these concerns or potential outcomes that we, we don't want to see happen. Um, so that is in increasing the, the option for smaller lot single family homes. Um, so that could be something that gets you a same or similar yield of units as you would in a multi-unit building, but that also ensures that it's more of a house scale building and then has the added benefit of more likely being owner occupied as well, um, which is a goal of the council. Um, similar option for perhaps one of the ways to get to the same idea is to reduce the lot size for duplexes. Um, it would have all of those same or similar benefits. They have a tendency to be more easily owner occupied um, it would break the building scale up to be smaller scale buildings. Um, and then the last option is if, if owner occupancy is the goal here, that row house building type, which, which currently isn't proposed there, might be more appropriate because it, it lends itself to owner occupancy simply because the lots and buildings correspond in a, in a row fashion as the housing type indicates, and therefore it can be platted more easily. Whereas a multi-unit building where the units aren't all on their own easily discernible lot, um, owner occupancy can be a challenge. So those are all things that are sort of in the air right now and are going back to council in March for further discussion. Um, that kind of sums up all the very high level highlights as well as things that are kind of in flux and changing. Um, most importantly, where are we going with this? As I mentioned, we have two more work sessions at council. Um, the one on the 27th is really dealing with some fairly routine articles that they just haven't seen yet. So chapter nine on, on signs, chapters 11 and 12 are on um, historic preservation and telecommunications, and chapter 13 on definitions. Uh, the March 13th date is where a lot of those housing issues will come back to them where we're hoping to get formal and final direction from them. And then that will set us up to make the changes to the initial draft that we think we're going to recommend for full um, adoption. And for those of the public that are interested in, that's when the more formal review and engagement begins. So the city plans on having um, workshops with all the boards and commissions to introduce them to these ideas, having an additional public open house where we can hear from the community of what they like and don't like, um, doing additional more targeted stakeholder outreach to particular constituents constituency groups if we need to. And then lastly, the formal adoption process, which would include public hearings where the public is specifically asked to speak on some of these that, that would follow up. And so our hope is to be beginning that process in, in April or May. So with that, I'll turn it over to any discussion um, of which I apparently left only three minutes for this, <laughs> this part of the meeting. 
Michelle, yeah, we have three minutes before we need to start planning commission, but do you have a question? Well, just a, just, well, it may not be a quick question at all, but um, that last topic that you were talking about, it, it, am I understanding correctly that it's basically changing or, put, or suggesting that the, any R1 district is no longer a one, basically, if it's there on a corner, it's now can be uh, up to four units or up to, it's just, it's going away from, it's not gonna be just one unit required. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the two things you mentioned, the first prerequisite that you mentioned is um, the only reason to do that would be to get a, an affordable unit out of it. So there would be some requirements of documenting, demonstrating, doing record keeping in that at least one of those units will be affordable based on where the housing policy lands on affordability rates. So um, currently in play is the idea that if it's a rental unit, it may be, need to be um, rentable at 60% of the area median income, or if it was owner occupancy, that it would either be 80% or 100%. So that would be a, an absolute prerequisite that it wouldn't be that any property could do this. It would only be right. properties that are ensuring that that could happen. And then the second thing you mentioned- So, so it's, it's, that's tied to a grant. So, that, so where's the grant money coming on that? Um, right now, there is not necessarily, the, the, the study on doing that is tied to a grant what the, the root policy is researching is, are these things feasible and buildable um, based on current market conditions? And okay. what we're, we're finding is they are, they wouldn't necessarily need any additional incentives to do that, that they, someone could build one of these building types, could rent it or sell it at those price points, and it could at least technically or, or conceptually work. Whether anyone would commit to that, it would be up to them and up to the individual property owners. Um, the second part of your question though is, um, we're looking at, well, would this be any property? Would it only be certain properties? What, what standards would it come in on is, is currently up in the air. And so we are looking at the idea of just corner lots in some districts, perhaps in other districts, it might be all of the areas. So areas that already have a mix of building types and building scale, um, R1, B and C mainly are the ones um, that might be more open to it versus R1A being more restrictive. And and that's why with the R1A, we're, we're trying to consider other things that could equally achieve those goals, but be perhaps less um, impacting in terms of the potential building scale that could be built. Okay, and, and it's time for PNC. I'm sorry if I took all the question time. Well, I, I thank everybody for coming out. I know we have some additional uh, discussion with the UDC during the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. So if there are additional questions, give us a few minutes. Nancy, do we stay on or do we just, or do we no, come back in? Uh, it is a different link. And I also want to let our public know there is public comment under on Planning Commission. So you would exit this meeting and join the Planning Commission link. And we have tested it, it's working. So again, apologies for the link not working for this meeting. Thank you all. Okay, I'll tell them I'm going to 